I don't recognize that as a British crest. I was orphaned as a young boy, raised by priests in a village outside Camelot. And they knew nothing of your parents? Your family? I was brought there by a man from a faraway place. He told them I was valiant, and that became my name. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about movies based on comic books that people have stopped talking about. I am one of your hosts, Jordan, and joining me today, the Prince of a Lost Dynasty, <laughs> often on our shores, hailing from the frigid and distant north, known to the ancients as Ultima Thule, but to you and I as Canada. It is Kumar. Is it known that I'm a prince or is it a mystery? Ah, uh, good, good question. A <laughs> Good question, because that's very relevant. Is the title okay. Prince Valiant, but it's a mystery that he's a prince? <laughs> oh, God. This is the first thing that's wrong with this movie. Oh. Uh, the well, the first thing that's wrong is I was, you know, do you remember, you remember the scene with the deer? <laughs> you remember that lovely scene where... In 1954, Prince yep. Valiant, where he comes across the field of deer. And you remember all those colors? Yes. And, you know, all that kind of that kind of naive but lovely stuff. Um, yeah, that's what's missing. Um, <laughs> yep. But before we get there, I have two corrections to make. So uh, to last week's episode, one is that there are current Fantagraphics reprints in deluxe hardcover volume of Prince Valiant. Okay. Um, but I found online some people are complaining about the colors, the color, the <laughs> recoloring on those. Oh, that's uh, a which is the across the board almost anything doesn't matter how awesome the company is. Even like Fantagraphics, people will complain about the recoloring because uh, apparently they're they're quite um, I don't know if bright is the word, but they're quite thick compared to you know, I think the newspaper colors were a bit more subtle, and even the old Fantagraphics reprints which is basically what we've been reading, uh, are a little bit more dialed down. Um, the other question I wanted to make was that um, we mentioned uh, Gasoline Alley came up, which is another strip that ha aged in real time over like 70 years. And I said there were no movies. There were two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> two that came out in the same year. That. I'm glad you caught that. Well done. Um, and I don't remember what I looked at that that came up, but anyway. Um, so what are we talking about today, Kumar? Well, so, we've yeah, we're we're going to talk about the 1997 uh, Prince Valiant movie. Um, now, I actually, I so for my, so this is a thing we're going to run into. Like, what do we read this week? Because we've already done one movie. Like, when when we get to like Batman or something, what the hell are we going to read? <laughs> um, yes. So uh, I did read the next year. So I think I read like the first 52 pages, Sundays or whatever, last episode. So right. I read another, did you read it, do any more reading? I did do a bit more yeah. reading as well. I just continued on from where I was. I jumped right. around a bit. Uh, you can just pick up, pick it up or put it down anywhere because of the episodic nature of his adventures. Yeah. I read some of the stuff that is currently being published this very month. Okay. Um, well, maybe you should talk a little bit about that first. I'm curious to hear what that, what that was like. So it's Mark Schultz and... Um, Tom Yates, I believe. Correct. Yes. You can go on to the website. I believe you mentioned it last week, Comic Book Heaven or something along those lines. Okay. And uh, yeah, you, you start with the most recent and then you have to, you kind of, you go backwards through each okay. panel uh, to the preceding weeks and then the preceding week. Oh, so okay. it's sort of an odd way to read it. I couldn't quite figure out the interface well enough oh, okay. to go back to a certain point. Uh, so what I essentially did was just sort of flicked through reading it in reverse, which despite the episodic nature of the comic, you cannot really do. <laughs> but it, it was, um, I can see how they've they've tried to keep some things the same. They still have the caption storytelling, no word balloons. Uh, the bright colours are still there. They've got... They're like half page size, right? They're not like a full... Like... Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Not sure, but they looked to me like they were more like landscape than portrait because they were like half. I'd still say I think it's still portrait. Okay. In 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 essence, but it certainly looks more modern. 
uh, in that it's going for more a kind of more modern arrangement of panels, okay. inset panels, panels of varying size, not the, the kind of static, uh, almost, uh, how did I put it last week, tapestry-like. Yeah, yeah, but Hal Foster sometimes would kind of make, change shapes and stuff, but then he would make sure to number the panels so you know which order to read them in. Oh, that was incredible, yeah. yeah. Yes. So it's a bit more, uh, a bit more uh, modern uh, in that respect. And uh, Prince Valiant still has – Prince Valiant is definitely older. I didn't read far enough to see anything about <laughs> what Prince Valiant was up to. It was mostly about, I think, maybe one of his children <laughs> or perhaps okay. grandchildren. Grandchildren, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he was still there and still sporting – still rocking the Prince Valiant. Oh, ex. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Okay. okay. Well, I read – so, I, as I said, I read the second year, so some interesting things – Important things come up, especially as it pertains to today's discussion. We meet Excellent. Morgan Le Fay for the first time. She yes. actually casts a spell of some sort, which really it just seems to be hypnosis. Um, mm. It doesn't seem like actual magic. But Merlin casts a spell that causes her to have nightmares. So much like the dinosaurs and giant crocodiles, there's a degree of magic, but it's very conservative. It's it's hedging its bets. Yes. It could be magic, could be could be mundane. Yeah, I don't know how he would make her have nightmares from a distance, but it's, I don't know, it happens. Um, uh, he gets a singing sword uh, from Arne, uh, who is his rival for Princess Eileen. Uh, and the sword is described as charmed, quote unquote. And we don't really know, what does that mean? Does it mean magical or is it just... You know, again, hedging his bets. Uh, we get the famous scene on the bridge where he fights off a horde of Vikings by himself uh, because he's basically got the bottleneck um, and they're all piling, they're all falling off into the water. Um, we're introduced to Slygon. Yes. Uh, who is the villain in both movies, uh, who is the usurper of uh, his father's throne. Um uh, and at the end of year two, Eileen is dead it seems um, yeah i'm not sure if i so. believe it but um they they found her ship crashed on the shore and uh thagnar the i think was the name of the viking that abducted her um he they're assuming he's dead and she's dead um and it's important that she's dead actually because it stops because they were going to fight to the death over her um and uh when I think it's Gwen after she dies. I think it's Gwen that tells him, "Look, this is actually a good thing because otherwise, you would have had to kill one of you guys, and then she would have had to marry a murderer." But <laughs> yeah. okay, he's killed a but, lot of dudes already. So can anyone I, be a murderer in this world? I mean, yeah, I don't quite follow the logic, but anyway, it kind of resolves that. So if she turns out to be alive at some stage, uh, I don't know because we do know that he actually marries Alita. Um, later on down the track at some mm. stage. So I don't know if we're actually going to see Aline uh, alive again or what. Um, he does show up. So I complained about the him showing up incognito at the tournament in disguise. Uh, I said that that was a ripoff from Robin Hood, but he actually kind of does it in year two at one yes. stage. And, and he's, not, he's not impersonating Gwen. He's just shows that he just makes himself some white armor and, and enters as a participant. Uh, interestingly, a detail which is carried over to the 1997 film. Yeah. Um, Am I getting ahead of myself here? Yeah, but in the yeah. movie, they also have it as him impersonating Gwen. It's almost like they watched the 1954 movie and didn't read the comics. Likely. Is likely. kind of what I kind of got some vibes off of at stages. Not um, unlikely. Because it almost relates to the 54 movie in the way that Batman 89 related to Batman 66. Uh, there's almost that kind of you can kind of see what well, it's a lot faster to watch a movie than it is to read 50 years of comic books yeah um uh what else did i write here oh yeah so there were in this year two there were more panels that were i would call literal showstoppers like i stopped and stared at them especially mm. if it was the full width of the page it's it's usually like um, Val entreating some king to do something, and you've got the whole court of people around, and like the yeah. furnishings on the walls, and all, and the throne, and everything is all drawn in. And I would stop and stare at those for 
um, quite a bit. Um, what else did I write? There's a there's a panel where he encounters the Northern Lights and they seem magical. Again, that's kind of like a real. It's a real. They don't see. He doesn't describe as seeing magical, but you can see how I think he would. He see, yeah, he would how see he might like, see it as being magical because yeah. he doesn't have the intellectual uh, framework to see it as a natural phenomenon. I think it, it's. He's. I think Hal Foster's been quite clever in that respect. There's a bit. Of, there's a, a nod and a wink to us, the modern audience. Oh, yeah. this is an alligator. You know what it is. Yeah. But Vince Valiant thinks it's right. a dragon. Never mind that an alligator shouldn't be in. Right. <laughs> yes, yes. At least English, you know, swamp to start yeah. with. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the northern hip, hypnosis, the northern lights, the, you know, these are magic spells, but you, the audience, wink, you know that there's just uh, some psychological kind of like misdirection going on here. Um, I, think it's, I think it's quite clever. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And um, final thing I n noted was... Um, there's a there's a moment where he's on the run from a knight that's chasing him. I think it's a knight or a couple of knights or something. And he goes, he charges through the doors of Camelot, through the gates. The knight's still following him, and he comes crashing to a stop on his horse in front of King Arthur's throne. And it's a kind of crazy moment, but it's important because if I watched the 97 movie without reading the comic, I would re that would be a scene there's a scene very like that in the movie at the very end absolutely is and i didn't I would be like uh, i would be this is really dumb but uh that's like a moment that's actually oh maybe they kind of got it from the comic oh okay so you see i didn't read i didn't either didn't get to or i skipped over that particular yeah. page okay. so when that happens in the film i yes it's the most ludicrous thing <laughs> imagine <laughs> ludicrous yeah. 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 So as a, uh, I, well, it's, no, it's it, not the. Mo I wouldn't say most because there's more ludicrous stuff in this movie. Than that. There's a lot of ludicrous stuff in this movie. Um. But, well, yeah, I too read a, a bit. Like I read some of year two. I, I jumped around a bit, as I said. I, re I, I I jumped ahead and read some much later ones. Uh, I read some of the ones that came pretty soon after. I read the section where he is eventually knighted and becomes a knight of the Round Table. Right. So. They they fend off an invasion of England and uh, it's 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 cool it, it's really good it's really plotted and really well drawn. Uh, Arthur and Prince Valiant end up enlisting Prince Valiant's own people who know the who live in the in the fens yeah. and who know the area better than anyone. And the Vikings the invaders are advancing through the fens and they use fire and misdirection. And their knowledge of the swamps to uh, to uh, annihilate them in a, in a great and bloody battle. And there's even maps showing where all the respective forces are. It's quite fun. And yes, at the end, uh, a bloody and battered Prince Valiant uh, is is knighted by uh, King Arthur. And then they travel back to Thule to uh, apparently, which had never been possible until Prince Valiant became a knight. <laughs> <laughs> they all hop on ships and head back. Because that's what he promised. At the very beginning, he promised his father he would become a knight and then come back. Oh, my God, you're right. Oh, my. Yes, you're quite right. Oh, no, no, he didn't. No, no. Oh, no, no wait, that's in the wrong. film. That was in the movie. No, no, you're wrong. That's in the film. Ah. That's in the movie. Ah. In the, yes, he just went off and met that knight. Yeah, so no, no, it's not, maybe not explained in the comic why that would have to be. But he goes to see the witch again because he does want to retake his, the his castle kingdom. from Slygon, and he visits the witch to get another prophecy to see if it can be done. Um, and I, he didn't get too far past that. Right. Well, anyway, he, when he does go back to uh, his kingdom, to Thule, it, it's over quite quickly because Slygon, in the comics, abdicates. Okay, got it. He's not killed. He's a weary tyrant, tired of looking over his shoulder at all of his vicious courtiers waiting to stab him in the back and he says that if Val will let him go into exile he will voluntarily step down and hand over oh. the kingdom to his father so you, may, you may have skipped it because he meets Slygon before that like he I did. I did skip ahead. Is, cap, is captured by Fagnar and yes that's his brother in the film anyway in the film he's just he's just a uh, uh, he's a citizen he's he's any or he's a he's a he's a high up in his army or something like that 
And when they arrive in Denmark, uh, one of the locals says, well, if you're looking for Thagnar, go see Slygon. So he goes to his father's castle where Slygon is ruling. Mm. And um, I can't remember how they get out of that uh, exactly. But then uh, that's after the after that they leave. And uh, I think they even do they suspect that he looks like Valiant. Yes, I think his aide, like his uh, his the king's aide, is like I think this is Prince Valiant or whatever. Uh, somehow he gets away from there. That's when they find that Bagnar and Eileen have died. They find the boat crashed up on the rocks. Uh, right, so, so I read it quite a, yeah. a bit. Uh, yes, but that's interesting because in contrast to both the movies, Slygon doesn't die. Uh, he, uh, sorry, both the movies Slygon dies, yes. but in the comic he does not. Yeah. And in fact, the um, new subplot kicks off with Slygon's daughter right. uh, uh, being a, something of a love interest for Val, or not a genuine love interest. Okay. See, she's lost him. Yeah. He's much yeah. too cool and detached for that. Right, right. Uh, oh, and Merlin has a, a literal fairy garden. So there is some weird magic-y stuff there, too, because when Val walks around Merlin's garden, there's all sorts of weird little fairies and stuff in there. Um, okay, so 1997. <laughs> so somehow we've got this very, we got this very fuzzy, looks like a TV rip. It's in the, it's in four three ratio. It's, it's okay. Anyway, 1997. This is the quality by, of the, of, of so. the version we watched. Yeah, uh, directed by Anthony Hickox, um, who was the director of Waxwork one and two, uh, Warlock two, and Hellraiser 3, which is a really Interesting. pretty awful movie. Um, I haven't seen the Waxworks, uh, I haven't seen the Raw 2, but Hellraiser 3 is the one with like the um, the CD player Cenobite and like the movie camera Cenobite, like that all just get formed after this dance party that like this nightclub gets attacked by Pinhead. Um, it's really dumb and bad. Um, <laughs> well, he has four minutes. It's uh, 90 minutes, it's an hour 22 without the credits it's a pretty short little fast thing i wonder if something's really cut felt because, very long uh it feels really long but i felt like stuff got i think stuff got cut out of here because um so <laughs> yes i would say so. <laughs> well okay so okay so it opens uh opening credits they've got the the prince valiant logo i was like okay here we go just like 54 yep. did they've got panels from the comics i was like okay here we go 54 did the same thing uh, I'm into yes. this. Um, as the movie goes along, there's little animated rotoscope sections, uh, which are broken up into comic book panels with little captions and stuff. And uh, it looks a little bit like kind of Ralph Bakshi. Uh, well, not really. I just just because it's rotoscope. Um, but um, I appreciated those sections. Um, yeah. I appreciated it too. I think it was a good idea. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good and idea. In... <laughs> yes. Although, yes, and in a different film might have been very effective. Oh, yeah. I, in fact, I wanted the whole movie to be rotoscoped, uh, watching those bits. Um, okay, but here's the thing. So the movie is called Prince Valiant. And as we mentioned at the Hint start, it <laughs> so I, I wrote it down. He never, nobody even says his name is Valiant until about, I think like 30 minutes into it where the whole time he's never referred to by name as far as I can remember. And then finally at some stage, Eileen calls him Valiant and he hasn't told her his name. So it's happened off screen at some stage. She, he has said he's named her, right. but, and this is after him. this, I think this is after all the stuff where he says he's, he was left an orphan and he's got some medallion. It's every cliche. Um, yep. He, he was left this this uh, red stout this medallion with a red stallion on it, and he was left as an orphan and raised. Um, and he uh, becomes a squire. They don't know anything about his history, but because the movie's only an hour and twenty two minutes, at the one hour mark, we learned that he was the prince. But the movie is called Prince Valiant. Yeah. And in fact, <laughs> in fact, oh sorry, there is earlier. So one of the reasons I brought up the little animation bits I like is that. Sometimes you learn characters' names 
through the captions and the narration in that as if you've heard their name before they mention like in one of the captions it says valiant did this and this and i'm like wait a second you have not told us that his name is valiant in this movie uh at this they're just like uh we're just supposed to assume um okay so i haven't mentioned that um valiant is played by stephen moyer uh who i know from True Blood. He was the male right. lead on True Blood for I watched all like six or seven seasons of that show. I don't know why I watched it at the end, but I did. And um, he was the uh, uh, vampire that was not supposed to age, but was getting older every year. The show went on. Um, he was 27 at the time of shooting. Um, Catherine Heigl was about 20, and she's in this. Uh, so this mm. is two years after Under Siege: Dark Territory with Steven Seagal. And one year before Bride of Chucky, which is an awesome movie. Um, but she hates everything that she's been in. She hates writers. She hates directors. Uh, I'm not sure why she's an actress, but she complains about all this constantly. I haven't heard what she said about this movie, but um, sure, it's negative. Uh, it can't be good. Uh, did you happen to see the Warwick War Davis's comments about this movie? on? The, I like, did, the actually. I found them in his autobiography. Uh, yes. which I couldn't find a copy of, so I can't get the direct quote. But I can give you the quote, which anyone can find on IMDb, yeah. which is, in his autobiography, Size Matters Not, The Extraordinary Life and Career of Warwick Davis, uh, Warwick Davis, an actor in the film, called it an absolute disaster, yeah. which was premiered, panned, and bombed. And even the wonderful Joanna Lumley, who still put in an amazing performance as Morgan Le Fay, couldn't save it. It then goes on. He blames this on the director, who, who he says, quote, seemed intent on partying all night long and giving roles to his friends. Oh, he gave a role to himself. He's Gwen. <laughs> He's Gwen. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, Joanna Lumley is in the first scene as, as Morgan Le Fay. She digs up Merlin's corpse and grabs a magic book out of his hands. And she is great. She looks... Um, if you'll pardon the pun, absolutely fabulous, and she, her voice is really perfect for the role as well. Um, yeah, she's, I absolutely love her. Every time she's on screen, I was like, "This is so great." I love, I love her in this, in this role. Um, yeah. But right off the bat, it is grim dark. What we would call in 2022, we'd call it grim dark. They've gone for all the colors have been sucked out of the. They put in these comic panels at the in the opening credits. Um, they've got these occasional animations, but if it's not for that it would just be brown and black um yeah beginning it's perfect example of what i was talking about last week with yes exactly yeah yeah going too far into the alleged grimness of medieval life yeah. the funny thing is i think i think you did you asked me at some point either on the podcast or outside of it why does this movie exist you know like <laughs> This is long past the time when Prince Valiant yeah. was popular. Yeah. Uh, we already, you already had the Prince Valiant movie in the 1950s, which, while not great, was it's it's there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they clearly watched it. So, it's not like a huge name brand, and it's not. If it was 10 years later, if it was 2007, I could kind of understand it, or 2017, because then we're at the stage where people are looking for brand name properties yes. anything that's got a name no matter how minor it is has yes. potential you can't to be file it as desperate mining of the past yeah. or, or desperate nostalgia mining which is what characterizes a lot of films in the present uh I, because it's the late 90s we, we we can't really call it that yeah so well i have a couple of theories as to why this okay. film exists cool. the first theory is that it's produced by germans Okay. Apropos of nothing. All right. The, it's a German production company that produced it. It's yeah. a British Irish German collaborative project. Yeah. And I think most of the money came from Germany. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. I, Prince Valiant. Sorry, go ahead. Go on. I was, I was going to say, say, I bet Prince Valiant is popular in Germany. Just like David Hasselhoff. You got yeah, it. Well, just like the Phantom in Australia, I bet it yes. has cultural currency there. You're right on, right on the money. It's called Prince Eisenhurst, Prince Ironheart awesome. in okay. in Germany, and apparently it's enormously popular. Okay. I so believe. that's one 
Yep. Yeah, so they that's one reason why it's there. That's where the money that would explain so, why Udo Kier is in this as Slygon. <laughs> what a role. A what very a, dark uh, fan or it's almost like he's doing brown face, but he's not brown. Like he's so dark in this. This is supposed to be a, a, a I mean, Slygon's always a bit swarthy in, in the comics and in 1954. But in this one, he just he looks like the way the comic represents the Huns. So, like, yeah. I read some of the chapters with the Huns and and the Huns are not treated kindly. <laughs> they're essentially just they're, they're brutish savages that are hunted down like animals constantly by by Prince Val and wrecking civilization and overthrowing the Roman em- Empire. Uh, but yes, uh, he, his role, <laughs> you don't care, as Slygon, just bizarre. He looks like Attila the Hun. Yeah. <laughs> acts like a like a like a like a sort of acts like an idiot jumping around. Yeah. Being silly. Um, well, let's, speaking of jumping around, let's jump ahead because I want to talk about his death. Um, because okay. I can't let, you, can't let you get this far ahead yet, Kamal. You, you've got to let me finish what oh, I'm. Okay, right. okay. You've got to let me finish okay, here sorry. with like, this stuff. Yes, the, right, other yes. Thing, the second thing I think is I thought about this film in, in the context of some of the big films of the 90s. Okay. And there are a string of films in the 90s that are kind of action adventure films. Okay. That are vaguely literary or have a story okay. with the quality. Okay. So I'd start. So we have. Uh, do you remember Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the first one I thought of. It, it even has that rock ballad. Anything oh, Jesus, I right. do. <laughs> and this film, Prince Valiant, oh, has right. a rock ballad over the end credits. Oh my God. Okay. There's also uh, The Three Musketeers, which I think also had a rock ballad. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Mask of Zorro, Antonio Banderas. That's a little later, 1998. Uh, the and the Man in the Iron Mask. Right. Also 1998. So I think you have these films that make that make money in and that period. I think period. Man in the Iron Mask actually was made earlier and came out later because of Titanic. I think they held it. Right. There's a couple of others which I wouldn't technically call having the same kind of storybook quality uh braveheart 1995 braveheart is more like gladiator because gladiator came out in 2000 and i think that kind of moved away from these action adventure adventure style films Maybe braveheart to the is more closer to braveheart's a little bit it's got the castles and the armies attacking each other yes but I, it's less of a quest yes right, like a right, kind right, of force yeah yeah. Hero's journey kind of story. Right. Uh, I think you know, like we, after Gladiator, we we have more historical epics, uh, and these kinds of forms sort of disappear. But I can see, I can imagine vaguely someone saying Three Musketeers by Alexandra Dumas doing well. What else we got? <laughs> oh, we've got, you know, we like, uh, <laughs> you know, we like chivalry. We like, yeah, we like uh, knights. You know, like the past, the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah. How about Prince Valiant? Yep, yep. I so those are my two. Those are my two working theories. I believe it completely. I, I think you're. I think you're right. <laughs> um, that it, that does explain how it got made. Um, it doesn't explain how it got edited. So right off mm-hmm. the bat, after Joanna, so there's actual there's actual magic. There's full on magic in this movie, unlike the comic strips. Yes. Or 54, yes. which had zero. 54 didn't even have Northern Lights. This has got giant have, gators yes. in it. And it's got a magic mirror that she can see. Morgan Le Fay can see, like, across the kingdom or whatever. Yes. All yeah. the kind of unambiguous there. magic. Yes. Morgan Le Fay um, is a sorceress. Also, it doesn't have Prince Valiant's haircut. Uh, Ooh, so disappointed. So <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> He did not have the guts to go the full Prince Valiant. No. Unlike the Adrian 54, yeah. if you Google Prince Valiant haircut, it's all him. Just image up, promotional image after promotional image of him with that famous haircut. This guy, he didn't have the guts, and I, I really, really. <laughs> well, I think that. the hair. I think it's Oops. very early in Stephen Moyer's career. I blame the director and the hairdressers and all those people for saying, "How can we modernize this and make it cool?" Yes. Um, but Prince Valen is kind of, you know, it's, as I said, the strip itself is kind of innocent and naive, and this is trying to get. And I think, especially the second half, I think there's three writers on this movie, but especially as you go further into it, the dialogue becomes more modern and quippy and stuff. 
and oh. um, starts to sound less and less. Like the first half, I felt they were trying to sound like Prince Valiant and trying to sound archaic. And as you but go later with on, the odd, but with the odd, odd modern kind of quip thrown in. Well, so there was a I very mean, starring sorry. moment early on during yeah. the duel where um, Valiant in Gawain's armor out. Prince Arn, his opponent, who's about to beat him down as a better swordsman, he says, your baldric is undone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then he yeah. punches him in the nose. Uh, and I, I just, what? what? Yeah. Uh, the bit I didn't like was, the line I didn't like was when, after the tournament, when he's, when he's kind of uh, won. Okay, so we get more romantic hijinks in the same way we had in 54, where there's confusion where he's impersonating Gwen and Eileen falls for him because she thinks he's Gwen, blah, blah, blah. They make Google eyes in the first shot of the movie. I'm like, what? Anyway, so the King Arthur asks him, how did you beat him? And he says, uh, luck, like hesitant, hesitatingly says. So to me, this was like, okay, not only is it not, it's, it's, it doesn't sound like something people from Arthurian times would say, Val would never describe his luck. Val works hard right. to get where he's at. He would have been clever about beating someone, and he would have yes. beaten them. He would have not said luck and shrugged his shoulders. That's right. He doesn't make wisecracks. It's a he's failure not to a... understand the character, I think. Absolutely. And in yeah. fact, it's no one's really like their characters in the book no. in this film. I, I, they've really just taken the names and haven't even taken the haircut. No, and just and they haven't even taken the backstory. They've just come up with these That's right. this Prince back. A completely new backstory. You know what, it, reminds a, an... me, it, it actually reminds me of the the Thor, the Marvel Marvel Cinematic Universe Thor movie. Because when I, I first saw the trailer for that, I was like, Thor is, is public domain. He's a Norse god. The only thing you've got is the Jack Kirby armor. And for you to not use that Jack Kirby armor and just go with the Norse gods, why bother? Why yeah. bother? You, the one thing that this property has, and that's what I felt like here. The one thing we have is Prince Valiant. It, you, if once you're racist history, all you've got is an Arthurian, Arthurian uh, adventure movie where they're trying to get Excalibur, which just happens to be lying around in the throne room. A guy can that's just ridiculous. walk in there yeah. and get it. Um, all right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do, do should we give a plot synopsis? Um. Not bother. It's really okay. Let's yeah, not bother. I'm, I'm, kind I'm of cool man. I guess we can. Um. So basically, well, the basics. Okay, let's give a basic synopsis. So basically, um, Morgan Le Fay steals this this book, this magic grimoire, which was in Merlin's grave, and yes. she's able to use it. Um. Somehow it allows her to cross the waters. The now, the book. now I can't remember why she had the what? book. But it had, I, a prophecy, it had no, prophecies either. in it and stuff. And she wants Excalibur. So they send these people over to sneak in while the tournament's on. Because the tournament's on, the king has just left Excalibur sitting around in the throne room. Uh, a Viking really goes in there, takes, takes it. Um, and uh, then when they discover the theft... The English dis decide that the Scottish have done it because there's a piece of tartan sitting on the ground. And like, okay, the Scottish have done it. So the, all their armies are mustered to attack Scotland. Um, but uh, Eileen needs to be escorted home. And the only person left in the castle is Prince Valiant. So, they, so the king, King Arthur, sends Valiant to escort her home. But... Uh, when they're going, there's he's accompanied by like ten knights. So I don't know why in full yeah, plate armor. I don't know why he. Why is he still in disguise as 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 Gawain? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Why is he still in disguise? Oh, maybe because they need it to look like a knight. To I don't know. This is just maybe. big cannon. Not, maybe just maybe. to scare off attackers. Oh, they've they've got Sir Gawain with them. Um, uh, on the way when he's taking her, uh, they get attacked by Ron Perlman. Who lives in a cave and abducts women? I think, and he has a catapult that shoots fireballs out of the cave mouth. Um, he's some kind of this is some. It never goes into it, but he he's some kind of inventor. Because well, there are tripwires outside his cave. He has yeah, so it's later revealed that he was actually one of the Vikings. He was the guy that brought uh, Valiant to England. 
He's the guy that brought him when he was a little baby. Um, mm. But that doesn't explain why he stayed in England and lived in a cave and abducts women. Um, yeah. He, he's a cave. bad dude. He's a really bad guy. No one, no one's character is set up properly in this. Um, the, so, the characters uh, are all cliches. Yeah. And uh, no work is done on setting up anybody. Okay, so Gwaine comes after once he wakes up because he's been injured in the tournament. He wakes up. He's like, "Oh shit, I gotta say Val," which is I liked because that that happens in the comics all the time. It seems like more than yes. once. Gwen is like, oh shit, Val's gone out. I gotta go help him. So he goes up, but he gets captured. So they launch an attack to uh sorry, sorry. So there's a two-pronged attack because um they've gotten separated somehow. So Eileen is attacking, and um oh no, so she's sent oh my god. So he gets he gets Eileen Smith. home to her castle. Um, and then she's like, okay, you need to go stop the Scot. You need to or go stop the Vikings and I'll go stop the Scotch or something. Take this ring, show Arm that uh, it's proof that the Scottish are not the enemies. It was the Vikings we need to be going after. Um, he's like, okay, so he meets Arm. They have a fight because um, he doesn't believe him. Finally, he's like, okay, I believe you. They go, they go to where Gwen's been captured. He's in a tent. Meanwhile, uh, Eileen also shows up. Now, she has a she wants to become a knight. This is a subplot. She's tra- did a, right. done a bit of training. She wants to become a knight. Fine, whatever. So they attack at the same time. There's a fight that's full of quips and modern dialogue in this tent where I don't know why. The attackers are outside the tent, and they're stabbing people through the tent. I don't know why they don't tear down the walls of the tent. At one stage, Arn stabs a guy behind his back with two swords. He's not even looking. Through the fabric. Anybody. Why? Why so, just look at the guy and stab him with one sword? Yes. I don't understand any of this. The fight. film's full of stuff like this. Stuff that doesn't make sense and takes you out of the film. Yes. Um, but then they are attacked by uh so they so Slygon finally um attacks and beats them and he captures uh Eileen to take her back. It's Slygon's brother. Slygon never leaves. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's Stagnar. It's Stagnar, yes. Stagnar, so Stagnar yes. captures her. And uh, he, that guy, that actor, I had trouble understanding his accent, but maybe it was just the vo- the audio on our copy. The audio was. Um, it, anyway, so he throws um, Val off a cliff into water. Val washes up on shore. His horse is there, and he's holding on to the horse's reins. I don't know how this like, happened. Um, he gets out. He, he, he miraculously survives being immersed in water twice in full plate mail. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was an earlier scene where he's in full plate and he just walks. There's a weird shot where he's walking across the bottom of the lake. Well, Very no, I think weird. it's to be funny. Uh, oh. This this might be a moment that it's meant to be funny. A lot of stuff okay. in this film is meant to be funny. Like Valiant's, some of, some of like the, 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 the accidental victories that Valiant has where he, you know, like falls on someone or yeah, right. stabs himself or he punches a guy by making him look at shoelace. I mean, Baldrick. Yeah. And... Uh, I did read something on the IMDb website. This is unattributed thing, so take it with a grain of salt. But allegedly, the film was completely recut. I believe uh, without the direct input by the producers, the German producers. Okay. The director went away apparently on Christmas vacation. Uh, the prints were in Germany. They refused to fly him back to Germany to finish the film, and they. Filmed, they finished it themselves and cut out all sorts of scenes that were supposed to set up the f- humorous tone okay. of the film. And also, apparently, there was some religious aspects that were also removed, which, ah. again, would make it similar to the 1954 film, which is a very religious kind of movie, okay. but obviously not present in this one. Okay. And not really present in the Prince Valiant comics either, for that matter. Yeah. That was one thing I was interested in to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Um, yeah when I did my flicking through to see whether that tone ever cropped up and no, it seems yeah. to have originated with the film, the 1954 film. Um, so some, they butchered it essentially. Yeah. And I can see it because the, the editing is yeah, terrible. You yeah. You can see it. Um, I will say about uh, Eileen wanting to be a knight. I didn't mind that. I did mind her pulling up her skirt. Uh, so Val could we get a better look at her thigh. No, Very this original. was just, this was a scene where her knee oh. was hurt. Oh, and right. she, like, kind of hikes up her skirt a little bit so he can get a bit of a peek. I didn't like that bit. 
Yeah, it's just your body. That's that was shocking. I'm, I'm really surprised. Sure. Do you, I wonder uh, what well, you said about thing, this movie. A lot of the inter, a lot of the characters and a lot of their interactions are just utterly, utterly cliched. They fall in love instantly because why wouldn't they? They're the main characters in a movie. Of in course, the they're first, in their first scene in the movie. They look at each other with ogle eyes, and I'm like, wow, why is this? We don't know who either of these people are. In this anyway. Um, you know, a princess that wants to wants the freedom of being a boy. Again, I think it's pretty cliched stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I don't. You, you, the Slygon's nothing like he is in the comics. He's just this kind of like stereotypical. How to describe him? Even he yeah. he's sort of cowardly. <laughs> yeah. And, and foppish almost. So, okay, so I want to let's actually this is a good chance to talk about Excalibur and Slygon. So Excalibur gets stuck in the ground. Uh, there's a very weird scene where Udo Kier picks up Excalibur and pretends to thrust it around. He goes, ah, ah, ah. He's being silly, yeah. yeah so ah. He's thrusting it, and then somehow it, it like, like sparks come out of it, and like magical lightning, and then it falls on the ground and gets stuck in the rock. Nobody can lift it out. They need a true king to get it out. Um, sword in the who could that be? Um, sword in the floor. Yes, yeah, sword in the floor. Uh, so later... Uh, Fagnar uh, opens, he gets a hold of Morgan Le Fay's Merlin book, and he finds that the prophecy is a bit different and that he's actually the one that's supposed to, and he's able to get uh, Excalibur out of the ground, and he has a fight oh. with his brother. I don't How does know he get Excalibur out? He gets stabbed into the ground again, I well, think. Uh, here's so what happens, and then... Onto the, I can tell you what I saw in the... Slygon falls the onto the hilt of the sword, and oh, it... Right. And and then he goes, uh, like he's as if he's fallen onto a sharp pipe. He falls on the pommel of the sword, and, the it, the sword. and it goes right through him. It goes through him. We get a shot of it, an overhead shot of the the thing has gone through him, and the next shot, Slygon pulls it out of him, and we don't see that because it happens off off camera. Well, come um, on, it's a magic sword. It can bring people back to life with no foreshadowing whatsoever. Uh, well, he prayed to God. He prayed to. <laughs> oh, he there you prayed to God. It remind me of the ending of, well, this is the last shot of the movie, uh, where Eileen dies and l magic lightning comes out of Excalibur and brings her back to life. It reminded me very much of Return of Swamp Thing, uh, where Swamp Thing magically brings Abby back to life in the final shot of the movie. Right. Uh, uh, with some power that we've never seen before. At any point. Um, yeah. Yes. But Excalibur, right. what, what Excalibur's role is, is never properly defined. It just seems to have powers... It's a literal MacGuffin, along with Merlin's book. That uh, you know, they want the guys want Slygon wants Excalibur because it will make him powerful, all powerful, invincible. Morgan, well, yeah, you can rule. You, whoever has Excalibur will rule the world. Which yes, I except he can't even lift it. He he, can't, <laughs> he, oh. he had it and it, it zapped him and then he dropped it in the ground. Yeah, and then they need. Morgan, and then they need um, Prince Valiant to pull it out of the stone. Sorry, spoilers. And uh, Morgan Le Fay wants Excalibur because I think because if Excalibur is taken from Camelot, Camelot will collapse. And sure enough, that's what happens. Although it's never since Prince Arthur, since King Arthur just left it in his throne room, leaning on a chair. I wonder how <laughs> important it could have been to the future of Camelot. Honestly, uh, when when Thunga picks it up, uh, it, it imbues him with some kind of power in one scene, but it's never explained what, what that is, no. and it doesn't seem to do him any good in his fight with uh, Valiant later on. It does let them burst through stone walls gratuitously for no reason. Yeah. Just um, all sorts of things happen that are not set up, are not explained, and take me out of the film because I'm just saying, why is this happening? Why are they uh, bursting? Why are there crocodiles in, 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 in metal armor? Yeah. Yeah. Why, yeah, why, are they, yeah, why, yeah, why are they in full plate armor all the time? That was, like, really bothering me. Anachronistic. Well, yeah, exactly. They should be wearing chain mail. And he finally That's does later on. It's right? almost like there's a scene when he finally – oh, because he goes in the water. Uh, this is before they get to Eileen's castle. He goes in the water. He comes out unconscious. She kisses him for some reason when he's unconscious. I didn't get that. Um, I she's going to give him mouth to mouth. But uh, she just makes out with an unconscious guy. She just yeah. commits sexual uh, assault. And then um, she, so then when he gets to the castle, his armor is rusting already. And he says, can I get some armor? 
and he gets some chainmail, and it's almost like this is supposed to be the uh, superhero gets his uniform that we're used to moment, if any of one watching this movie knows what Prince Valiant is. Um, anyway, um, so she's decided, so at this, mo- point, at this point, they're like, we're in love. They kind of know it. Um, and he, so when he meets Arn and after the fight, um, they're, when they're looking down the hill at the tents, Arn says, I could never marry a woman that didn't love me in return. And it's ADR. Like, it's re- it's not recorded in the scene. It's like, geez, we need to explain why they're not getting married anymore. So they write this line in later. Um, uh, they mentioned that, so he broke Arn's nose at the tournament, and now it's not broken. So I'm wondering how much time has passed between the tournament and... Um, That's too much work to show his nose being broken. Just yeah. say it's... But they mentioned his broken nose. He says, you want me to break your nose again? I'm like, wait a second. Wasn't that yesterday? Uh, yes. I'm not sure. Um, no, no, no. Just, they just haven't bothered to... Just haven't bothered. Okay. So <laughs> Val, after, after <laughs> Val's thrown off the cliff, he goes to this town where he, he comes to the Moss Eisley Cantina. He meets Warwick Davis, um, who he protects from being bullied. And Warwick Davis is like, okay, I'm going to be your squire now, and I'm going to hang out with you and have fun. Um, the space- Yep. Uh, so then they go to Slygon's castle, which is his ancestral castle. He learns um, about his history through uh, uh, Tar? Roman, who oh. shows up, Boltar, whatever his name is. He shows up and tells him who he is uh, because Not he recognizes a medallion. Uh, Val scales the tower, uh, which I liked uh, because it was like out of the comics. It's something Val would do. And he does all the time. He's, he's up there with like a grappling hook, yeah, scaling cool. the battlements. Dramatic um, the horizon. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then there's a big there's a big fight. Morgan Le Fay uh, tempts him uh, with becoming a ruler and also magically changes her face to Eileen's face. And he's tempted by this. And I'm like, why? Did you not? <laughs> you see her face change. You know it's not it's, Eileen. Exactly. It's, it's just another cliche. It's just yeah. another cliche. Um, it's just going through the motions. There's a very elaborate death trap when Eileen and Val are captured with a with a, a candle burning a rope and they're over a pit of armored crocodiles. Um, takes oh. a very long time for them to die, but they catapult Warwick Davis over the battlements to rescue them. It's a catapult. You could have put anybody on there. Why did you put Warwick Davis on there except to insult funny. a little person? Yeah, because it's funny. This is supposed to be comedy. And what's uh, funny to toss a, a, a dwarf? So yeah, then we get a, an attack by uh, the Vikings, the few remaining Vikings, which is what happens in the comic and the 54 version. You get a small group of these Vikings uh, against, uh, you know, they're outnumbered greatly by the uh, enemies. Um, there are Chinese fireworks uh, in... There, there are crates labeled with Chinese script. Literally says fireworks. Oh, you'd know that. You can read it. Yeah, but um, I don't know how these ended up in Slygon's castle, but they're there, and we get a shot of them. So it's not like a mistake. It's like the director's like, look at this. We got Chinese fireworks. I guess it's like, okay, the Chinese had fireworks at this time, so that's their explanation for how they have this gunpowder. You're um, giving them way too much credit. I don't why know do why. They crocodiles? No, no, think about it. It's really like your screen is like, okay, we need fireworks in the scene, but they're like, wait a second. They didn't have fireworks in the year 1300, so... They're like, oh, but the Chinese did. So we'll, we'll just write Chinese writing on the box so we can say in their adventures they yeah. somehow got well, these. It's the um, sort of thing that would happen in the comic. There's, yes. You know, like Val's always running into historical figures and people from other places in the comic. But here, again, it's just another problem in a, in a problematic film. So um, finally, so I don't know why we need the fireworks in the first place. They don't affect anything that I can recall. Um Finally, uh, Val is fighting Fagnar, um, and uh, Fagnar's got Excalibur uh, or another. So they kept sw- they swap back and forth. But finally, he turns around while Eileen is running towards him, and Eileen runs onto Fagnar's sword very slowly. Like it's just he just slowly turns around, she just runs straight on. She him. ran from across the across the room. Across, oh, they're, they're she's outside. a trained. She's a semi-trained. She's had some combat training. And we've Allegedly. seen her fight throughout the movie, but she just runs yeah. on to the You're right. She, she was trained by that dead guy on the horse. That's right. Uh, but, uh, yes, a bit, you know, this is, um, so Thangar has Val at sword point, 
and they're surrounded by people gawping at them. This is outside in a courtyard because they burst through a wall and they've ended up in an outdoor area. <laughs> and people are just gawping within arm's reach. And then Catherine Hagel, you know, the princess runs from, from, from far away, from the other side of the courtyard. She runs <laughs> through a bunch of these bystanders <laughs> and runs onto Thangar's sword and dies. And then Prince Valiant... Call asks God to give him strength, but, except I think they cut the word God, so he just says, give me strength. I think he says God. I, no, not at that point. I'm, I'm okay. pretty certain. Right. He just says, give me strength. I imagine he said it originally okay. before it was butchered okay. in Ed. And then uh, he, he kills Thangar, but you don't see it. You just see Thangar looking a bit stunned. They don't even show him. Oh, his... right. he, he, he prays to God when, when she's dead. I think. Yes, yes, yes. He asks, you know, like, and, God. And Excalibur comes to life and, and imbues her with life, and she comes back to life. So, um, and then uh, then we get the big horse slide into into the throne room of Camelot, which is kind of out of the comic. And, so uh, stupid. He, he you know, uh, Prince, King Arthur's about to disband Camelot and send all his knights yes. away, yes. and then Valiant just rides through the doors. Boom! <laughs> Yeah, and the and, horse falls, but in the next shot, it's standing up, it's fine. And then Valiant is holding Excalibur, gives Excalibur to him and says, you know, I, Prince Valiant, rightful heir to the throne of, of Thule, uh, present you, King Arthur, with your with Excalibur once more and pledge eternal friendship and fealty between our two realms. Pause. Or something like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not my Prince Valiant. Hashtag. No, no. Um, nothing like Prince Valiant in the comics. Prince Valiant is, yeah, as you say, a very ruthless, methodical. Yeah. Well spoken. Um, well spoken, yes. Princely. Yeah. He, they're always remarking on his bearing, his princely bearing. Yeah. He's very much a character that doesn't really exist in modern fiction. He's a knight errant. He he wanders around doing good, but he also indiscriminately murders. I jumped ahead in the, in the comic <laughs> to a bit where they they introduce a character, uh, a Greek, okay. wearing implausibly like pre-modern like 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 a classical Greek toga, okay. almost. Yeah. And um, he's a thief, so he's kind of like your your, your fun kind of tag along character, mm. a kind of like a disreputable kind of thief character. The rogue. He tries to the to rob. Rogue. Yes, exactly. The roguish road. He tries to mug Valiant while he's bathing in a in a stream, and for the gems in the hilt of the singing sword, uh, a rock reveals him at an, a pebble reveals him at an inopportune moment. Uh, Valiant uh, blocks his attempt to kill him, and then calmly starts drowning him. <laughs> Just holds and and Hal Foster's uh, caption even says. Val coolly begins to drown the rogue, <laughs> or something along those lines, and, but then, for the but then decides to have mercy on him, pulls him out, and then they become friends. Yeah, and it's just like so. Valiant is the kind of guy that will play on a lute, uh, flirt with a maiden, but uh, but but also drown you if you try to mug him. Yeah, yeah. Um. And the character that we have in in this 1997 film is nothing like that. Yeah. He's much more modern. He's kind of like a, a, a goofy character that falls into adventure before he discovers his secret destiny. He makes wisecracks. He bumbles. He wins f- fights by flukes. Yeah. Uh, and nothing. And he doesn't even have the damn haircut, Kumar. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I was going to say the one thing I was going to say was that um, even the the naked uh, Catherine Heigl butt shot is like a violation of the the naked dude's butt shot from. That's from right. One or two, just, like, in Prince Valiant, I only expect to see naked boot dude butts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, muscular <laughs> naked dude butts. Um, <laughs> so I would actually like to hear your yay or nay on the current comics that you read. Oh, it's still a yay. Okay. They're, they're they're really good. I mean, they look great, and as I said, you they're really unique and different. 
from a lot of other things that you can read. But, you know, like I said, Valiant is a character that he's come straight out of, like, a medieval chronicle or something like that. He, You don't see characters like him in fiction anymore. He's, yeah, he, it's, and the art is beautiful. It's a real historical artifact. Mm. And yet it's still going. So you can still read the stories even today. And I can see why it's still going because it's fascinating and really beautifully drawn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really love the, the second year that I, that I read this week and it was really great. And, and again, the reason I did both in the row was cause I just, I just wanted to read more Valiant. Absolutely. Um, so there you go. Uh, okay. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, my- I was, there were moments that I liked, uh, were aspects that I like. And I, I did, I like the animations um and um i like any time it reminded me of the comic i was like okay and i loved joanna lumley joanna lumley's great uh the sets are quite good in contrast to the sets uh, in 54 the sets in this were pretty good there yeah was i like and also the there was a few of the scenes where they're traveling like across like almost like moors that were really that looked really good uh, I think the final battle looks like it was shot indoors. It really looks like Army of Awful. Darkness. Uh, Awful. The the fifty four's final battle was better. Here's the thing: like this this film is terrible. You must never ever ever watch it if you well, want to. The hard to Val- find anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. D- good, good. I'm a bit Duke surprised because, good. considering the names that are in this, I'm surprised that there hasn't some of the investors haven't pushed to get a DVD release of it in print. Because it's terrible. Uh, yeah, but yes. you've got uh, name actors. You can you can lure people into watching crap, and it's got a director that's got kind of is known among you know horror people. Right. Well, it's just one of those films that slipped through the cracks. Yeah. You get films like that every now and again. But yes, the uh, like bad performances, terrible action. You know, no one bothered to choreograph anything. They're just flailing around in close up. Yeah. It's yeah. awful. Awful. <laughs> yeah. Don't. And I'm revising my. I'm, I'm almost tempted to revise my vote for last week. I about, felt that way too. Because it. that's how good. That's how bad this film is. It makes the 1954 one that I didn't like look good, look great. So yeah. if you, if you are ever, if you read Prince Valiant comics and you're tempted to watch a Prince Valiant movie, do not watch this one. Watch 1954. It's much more. It, it's 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 better in every way, and it's interesting as a piece of cinema from the golden age of Hollywood. You know, like the the 1950s, the age of the great historical epic in Hollywood cinema. Yeah. Watch that. Do not watch this ever. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I guess adaptation. No, terrible. They just took <laughs> the names. They just they took the, the names name. and, and and slapped them on. Oh, the no. animation, the, the animations were, you know, look, look, were, that's a good, I think it's a good idea, and I'd like to, I, I, I'd be happy if the film was more like if they'd done something a bit more creative with the movie, if they hadn't just slapped generic the names of Prince Valiant characters onto these two dimensional yeah. characters in this movie, if they weren't just going through the motions, if it wasn't just an insipid tissue paper thin plot that I had trouble following. Yeah. then that might have been a good gimmick to help me get into the world. But instead, it's just sticking out as something else that didn't work in this movie of endless things that didn't work. Uh, okay, next week. <laughs> uh, Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon. Yes, that's right. And we're actually going to be watching this one at the cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but exciting. Maybe, we're not going to be doing any live podcasting during the cinema. No. We're not going to do that for the, all the patrons. No, I don't think it's going to make any difference to the people listening to the show. But uh, it, yeah, it'll make a difference course. to us. Yeah, that's right. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs>